All instruments are inventions and all music is made up. So make your own using microcontrollers, writes Helen Lee in volume 76 of Make Magazine. We are listening here to a sonic creature that Helen describes as a melodic circuit harp in a YouTube video, and she plays it by touching here and there in a fountain of wires. Welcome to MakeCast, I'm Dale Doherty. Just tell me first a bit about your background, where you grew up, went to school, <laughs> how you started working, doing things. Wow, no, that's uh, that's going back and mining the, the mists of time. So I'm originally um, Welsh. I'm, I'm from one of the least well-known Celtic countries. I grew up in a very ordinary town. My dad's a computer science teacher, uh, was, he retired, and my mother is a nurse, so... Yeah, just ordinary background. And when I went to school, we had like really terrible computer science and no mention of obviously there are no interesting microcontrollers um, in education then. What in, when I learned to use technology, it was like how to type and like how to use an Excel spreadsheet. And that was the uh, exciting extent of all my computer science lessons. So actually, I, I wasn't really particularly interested in uh, computer science or electronics when I was a little kid because the curriculum was so boring yeah you know and yeah. also not very challenging it's yeah can you figure out how to use a spreadsheet then you're probably gonna get an A in this class and obviously like I can figure out how to use a spreadsheet yeah. so it was never something that was particularly interesting to me I came into using technology in in the, well, I guess in the terms that we as makers would would use in my I guess my mid-20s when I was a, a writer um, and a book editor at the time and Intel really liked one of the book books that I'd written with a group of friends and they got us involved with a big IoT education project in London and that IoT project was based in Fab Lab London which was a makerspace it doesn't I don't think it exists anymore a lot of the London makerspaces have um, fallen by the wayside because of how expensive rent is in that city but yeah basically I walked into this makerspace and there was like tools going and laser cutters and 3d printers and like people just hanging out and making things and I just felt I don't know I just felt like I had come home it was um, very exciting to me and I've never left makerspace and hacker spaces since. So it was a pretty happy accident that I came to making. It was just through being hired to write on, on a maker project that yeah. I just fell in love with it. And, and it was at the time I was into education activism and I was very much working on a lot of initiatives to, to take learning outside of the classroom, to work on project-based learning, to work on alternative education. Yeah, it's alternative education. So instead of formal education, we're looking at peer-to-peer yeah. -peer learning. So as soon as I find the makerspace scene, it fits so immediately with with all the concepts that I've been working on for a number of years around, yeah, like alternative education. So it felt so natural to me and it was so easy to start including aspects of making into my education practice. And that was my entryway really into this world was was through education. And yeah, I've just never left. I learned how to I learned how to solder in a hackerspace. I learned how to use an oscilloscope by my friend Phoenix teaching me on her kitchen mm -hmm. table and how to use a how to use an oscilloscope for debugging all of the skills I've learned and I guess some people call me like self-taught but I don't actually think there's any such thing I consider myself fully taught by the community I learned yeah, it's just not a good word for that is there no and it's so <laughs> egotistical as well it's like, oh yes I learned this all on my own I just spontaneously got well, all this knowledge nobody you know, learns like that I think part then. of the <laughs> ideas around DIY isn't that you learn on your own but you somewhat have to take the initiative to get the ball yeah rolling. yeah of course you know you have to have like initiative which is right. something i've always had in spades but really i like think that most of my skills are like they're, they're from people on youtube they're from the books that i've read they're from the people who've taught me in their kitchens and they're from like the teachers who spent extra time with me like at the end of workshops so it's very much it's been a, um, a long and enjoyable journey that i'm i really feel like i'm only just starting on mm. but yeah so i got into this through makerspaces yeah, absolutely yeah, that's great <laughs> that that's really wonderful because i i think they're i believed in the power of makerspaces particularly in education that mm -hmm. when you saw the space it it invokes ideas about what could be done there. What are those tools? What are these materials? They're just even your background here. Yeah. I mean, oh, we yeah. could sit and talk around 
all of that. It's so different than looking like a cubicle, right? (laughs) Yeah, it's so much more fun and it's so inspiring. So I've literally, I've just, I'm I'm talking to you here from my little office um, here in Portland, Oregon. And I've just immigrated here a couple of months ago. So I've just, I've been resetting up my workbench um, with my tools and so on. And of course, like when I came here from Berlin, which is where I was for two and a half years, amazing hacker culture in Berlin, by the way, everybody should go visit that, that city. But of course, like none of my power tools will work coming over from the from the the electricity is not the same is it so i've had to re resupply my workbench and as you say like the, the having the tools for me it has given like the sense of possibility you see these things like i'm I've always been somebody who creates things based on the materials that I have around me. I get very inspired by a material choice. So I really, I really have always found like maker spaces and hacker spaces to be the most inspiring places because of materials and the tools, but also because of the people in them who are generally, yes, we're all slightly weird, of course, but in the best possible way. And I find that people are just so generous with their time. And I've tried to be as generous with my time back in terms of teaching and workshops, because it's, it's, it's a cyclical thing, isn't it? Yeah. So how did you get into music? Music, well, music has been something that I've been into since um, I was very young. Yeah, I remember listening to Zep 3 with my dad on vinyl. And he actually saw Led Zeppelin um, live in a Welsh village hall. So like I grew up around like rock and roll and, yeah. and, and blues and jazz. And my mother was like obsessed with Elton John as well. So we oh, were, okay. yeah. there was constantly music playing. I grew up in yeah. very much like it was more like a music consumption household, but rather than a music creation household. But then when I went to secondary school, I just went to an ordinary comprehensive school. I don't know if what the equivalent is, just like, High school, you know, probably, yeah. ordinary like yeah. you know, state school with a very ordinary curriculum. And, but I, I was also, I got very heavily involved in the music department at school. I, I spent a lot of time singing, actually. I was in both the school choir and in, I was in the, the choir for the Church of Wales as well, which it was, you can, can't picture it now, but like, like I wasn't religious, but it was a way to get paid for singing. And I was there in a full, like floor length cassock, burgundy cassock. I had <laughs> the full, like white ruff around my neck, like singing angelically about some stone church huh? yeah, yeah 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 absolutely it was this beautiful big stone church and then yeah so I, I got into it through singing and through the church music in particular they encourage you to learn a bit about the theory and we, we used to sing they teach us different like religious songs from like different parts of the world so I learned about like the spirituals from the US and I learned about like the secret hmm. messages behind them that were super interesting and important I learned about like traditional choral music and also like Wales has a, a where the country that I'm from has a very strong singing tradition. The stereotype about Welsh people is like all of us know how to sing. And there is truth to that. If you hear me spe- speaking to like my sister, I, I, I do balance my accent for Americans. Because if I speak full Welsh, like we speak very quickly and we do have a bit of an accent and our voice goes like this and up and down and up and down. It's like actually quite a musical it's accent. It's sort of musical in its own, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. And, and also like um, culturally, we we value both poetry and um, and song. We have these big yearly, our big cultural event of the year is called um, the Ice Steadfod. You can win all these prizes for, for like poetry and and song and stuff. So it's, it is cultural. It is partially because I sang a lot um, growing up, but and, and learned a lot of theory and music history from that. But also. I'd say I, like, I stopped singing when I was around 17 when, because I, I was ignoring what the church was and, and I was like, eh, actually, I don't really agree. Like I was a 17 year old queer girl and I'm like, you know what, maybe I don't think I'm evil. <laughs> it's possible that I'm not evil and these people might have it wrong. So I stopped going to church and I stopped singing. So for me, coming back to music later on in life was actually very much like a revisitation of my early, I guess my early practice, even though it wasn't practice, I was just a kid, like learning how to sing scales, whatever. But it was really interesting to go back to that and think about it and rediscover that outside of the context of religion. And also, yeah, it's just it's just a very it was very interesting to come back to that and remember that I still have those abilities. Like I put in Mm -hmm. the hours like it's, it's. 
yeah, there's an as like like any kind of um, creative skill, there is an aspect of talent, but largely it's how many hours you've put in. Yeah. And I still have the muscle memory. Like I can still hit and keep notes. Yeah, I'm a bit out of practice, but I still have that like memory from all those hours put in and the knowledge of the theory behind it. And also like this intuitive sense of what sounds work well together. But yeah, it's been really interesting coming back and revisiting that as an adult. But you'll still see like my work, I think is still quite influenced by there's some like elements of high church in there. Mm. And that kind of there is that kind of like reverby, I don't know how to describe it. But it's definitely there. It's definitely there. And I, I be think great. I one of the things I really wanted to talk to you about was creating music, like you mm -hmm. were mentioning that and mm -hmm. you have a really nice feel for like experimentation around music and, mm. and, and and in some ways we do inherit a lot of musical forms and, and identities around that and they feel fixed sometimes mm -hmm. and getting to the idea that as you say in the article that all instruments are inventions and people are. have figured that out and <laughs> you know they were trying to they ha they were trying to not only perform differently in mm. different ways, but also express things differently. Uh, and whether you, were you talking about the human voice or, or instruments, I just uh, you mentioned tape recorders in your article. I remember that's what it, in the sixties I grew up. I remember, I remember I had a, a small portable reel-to-reel -reel Japanese tape recorder, and it was really my favorite thing. I don't, I no, not necessarily for music, but just to be able to record something was really fascinating. And you wind it back and forward, but it it really helped to see musical instruments themselves, not just mixers and things as technology that, that were developed. Of course. It really brought that point home to me about, well, it's something I've always been talking about. I've always thought that the instruments are inventions and music is made up. And that's been a sense ever since I was in, because of my knowledge of music theory, because I know, and also because of like my knowledge of some kind of, uh, some of the, the history of musical inventions. And I know that the Western method of musical notation isn't the only one, uh, even remotely. Like there's all sorts of difference, all are created as a method of expression and some of those methods of expression seem to stick and some of them fall away i think it's almost sad to to think of all of the diversity of instruments that we have lost through the globalization of music that that point was really brought home to me when i was still living in berlin i visited this lovely museum of instruments and it had it had loads of harpsichords and loads of early kind of like pre-piano like keyed instruments and there were so many because back then it wasn't mass produced it would be a person or a team of people a studio or whatever who would make these instruments and as a result there was hyper customization there would be i saw like harpsichords on their end for the smaller space there was mother and daughter harpsichords that would work for children to play with their parents there were um, different technical innovations that happened um, and, and those technical innovations completely changed the the music that was possible so if you think of here's a famous piece of music the flight of the bum Bumblebee is a really quick one that everybody knows. It would have been composed because a technical um, innovation had made that quickness possible. So prior, like maybe like a hundred years prior to the flight of the bumblebees, it would not, even if the flight of bumblebees had been written, it you would not have it. been, exactly. <laughs> These compositions are actually um, very much influenced by the innovation in the, in the instrument realm. And that's something that I've like, that, that relationship is something that I find absolutely fascinating. And I hadn't fully, truly appreciated that until going to, to this museum when this lady, this curator was showing me around and she played us some really cool things on the harpsichord, was telling us about the history of the harpsichord. And, and then she was like, do you know why people stopped playing the harpsichord? And I was like, I don't actually, because you, you don't see the harpsichord around anymore. And it was absolutely fascinating because it's actually a political history, that reason. So the harpsichord used to be the, the go-to instrument for the French royal courts, the royal courts across Europe. It was the, the instrument of the aristocracy. And then when the um, revolutions happened, when they chopped off all the king's heads across Europe, including the uh, more famous French revolutions, um, the harpsichord was seen as a symbol of royalty and it was therefore it became like massively out of fashion because it was seen as a symbol of like corruption and stealing from the people and the piano the grand piano like the piano forte the piano that we know mm -hmm. today and um, was actually massively dismissed as vulgar by the king who eventually got his head chopped off so it was then seen as a symbol of modernism and basically replaced the harpsichord 
And mm. I just thought that was such a good story of how we think of technology and innovations as things that happen, they happen because somebody has a great idea. But that harpsichord example really made me think of that there are ideas that have their time. It's not necessarily always about the suitability of the piece of technology. There's often like context around that that we miss when we're looking at like the adoption or not adoption of, of these new technologies. In your article, you <laughs> talk about electronic music um, I do. And, the, yes. <laughs> and the early history of that. You mentioned a Daphne Oram, an early BBC yes. music pioneer a- who wasn't, I, I guess, wasn't taken seriously for a while, but had lots of ideas of what to do. Talk yeah. a little bit about that era, if oh. you will. I liked how you described it. The thing that was, oh, you can hear the Amtrak yeah. station there. <laughs> I live right next to an Amtrak station, so <laughs> my, sometimes the Amtrak chains, just, <laughs> I've arrived. I'm in Portland, everybody. It's just very enthusiastic about being recognized. So <laughs> just to let you know what that sound is going That's on in fine. the background. It's just the train saying hi Found music. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. There's just some great stories around the way because this reel-to-reel tape recorder that y- you talk about it was it was it was a piece of audio technology that changed a lot. You're able to with these magnetic reel-to-reel tape recorders, you're able to like cut slices of it and then stick it back together. In the old days, they would literally do that with a scalpel and right. some sticky tape. So this is cut and like cut, copy, yeah. paste, right? As the, they did with the film, itch. right? Oh, yeah. Right. It, right. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly the same thing. But um, this is the first time that it was you're able to edit things in that way instead of do this whole you have to, you can't do it in one shot you have you're able to edit and then it became a lot cheaper as well so that other, like ordinary people were able in the certainly in the 60s were able to buy their own reel to reel magnetic tape recorders which like when any kind of technology becomes popular enough to to make it into the maybe not mainstream but at least at least they're accessible to people who would be interested in it you're going to get people who start to play around with things and this new audio tape technology what found its way into the hands of some people who just wanted to mess around with it and they made there was a group of people in France who were the music concrete people there's also some guy in uh, I believe there was a, a gentleman in Egypt doing similar things at the same time as well but yeah basically this new technology was available to people and they started messing around with it started creating new techniques new sounds new yeah new ways of making music and to be perfectly honest with you dale and um, a lot of it sounded pretty terrible like a lot of these like experimental bit like circuit bending right? <laughs> yeah right it's really fun to do but at the end of the day it's not yeah. something you're going to put on in your car is it but that's not necessarily the point point right. is to create to experiment and then to figure out what you're going to do with it later the people who do experiment with things aren't necessarily going to be the end creators the person who designed the Arduino isn't necessarily going to be the end user either. It's <laughs> right. it's about making it open and making your techniques open. But yeah, that, that time of, that period of time in terms of music tech hacking was very exciting because of these new tools and techniques that were being opened up. And also the world was getting more global, so it was easier to share ideas. Increasingly, you, you could, you know, air travel was possible and people like Daphne Oram could go on. It's a lot easier then to go for a training day in Paris or whatever. So that freedom of exchange of information was a lot simpler than it had been in the previous 50 years. So it's a very exciting time in terms of technology and also in terms of exchange of information. But of course, for somebody like Daphne, even though she was ahead of her time in terms of the things that she was talking about and things thinking about and trying to get the BBC to start doing. But she was ahead of her time as well in that nobody wanted to listen to a woman's ideas. It's one of the reasons, to be honest with you, that it always really annoys me when people are like, oh, we need to engage girls. I'm like, girls are already engaged. Y'all need to stop pushing them out. Thank you very much. It's like, you can look me in my face and tell me that girls need to be more engaged when you are pushing people out. No, I don't think so. We need to not say it's the girl's fault for not being interested. It's just like one of my biggest bugbears. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and Daphne Aram is a you know case in point, obviously from, it's not like, it's not like they, there was no pipeline back then. People yeah. are being pushed out. Like yeah. that's unfortunately the realities of it. But she got pushed out of her job that she that she created basically. But it's not like she had a sad, she didn't lie down and die after leaving the BBC. She was actually pretty awesome. She went on to create her own 
studio, create her own synthesizer. In fact, her, her synthesizer, the Oramix machine, is in London Science Museum now. She wrote a book that's just been republished, actually, called An Individual Note, which is all about sound, physics, and electronics. It's really? wonderful. Yeah, wow. yeah. I think her estate released it again. It's available again now. It's definitely an interesting little book to look at. So, yeah, yeah. her work is coming back. It's some of this experimentation ended up being in recording studios oh. and really what we think of as pop music so much of it was cr really studio created right? as, as opposed to concert created or, or yeah, live yeah. music and the idea of being able to record tracks and, yeah. and remix things all that but it was really from the time of the beatles and maybe a little earlier yeah i mean you, actually you the, the, beatles, to see that. the beatles are the classic example yeah. of how this technology made its way into mainstream studio recording so there's like a, the Beatles track on Revolve that... I know, I had uses, to go listen to it. I saw um, It's Tomorrow Never Knows. But anyway, that one um, was the first mainstream track to use these concrete, music concrete techniques. And if you go back and listen to it now, you don't really... I guess you don't necessarily think about how the techniques were groundbreaking at the time. But like all the sounds in the background of that music are actually yeah. recordings that the Beatles made themselves. And the, the, there's like a weird... Nice, and that's yeah. and that's Paul McCartney laughing, and it but sped up. Yeah. So they got really into it. They got really into it, and and like these kind of techniques, you listen to them now, and they just sound normal. They Pretty weren't normal. normal. Right. They've yeah. been made the norm. Yeah, and, and it's really exciting to see how people who were just experimenting with sound and making strange noises and then sharing their techniques actually managed to really influence mainstream studio recording. It's really cool. Yeah. And I just love the idea of there's the audio engineering side uh, of sound, but then there's the creative side of people making music and putting them together. And they were really working off each other. Of like, course. what can we do? Or yeah. can you do this kind of thing? Yeah. Uh, very nice. And I, I hope that can influence makers as they th think about, like part of your article is about microcontrollers and yeah. making music with everything from Makey to a, a new board I didn't know about, Bella. I'm such a fan girl. I'm such yeah. a fan girl. <laughs> <laughs> I've got their new sensor actually as well. The maker audience are familiar with Makey, but you know yeah. certainly for parents and, and and children, it's a great place. There's a picture of you in the article of making music with Jello, I think. Yes, that's true. So I, I use them lots and lots of different boards to make music with, and sometimes I don't use boards at all. Shocking, I know. But the Makey is probably my go-to introductory board, particularly for people with families. It's just such a nice way to make like silly music, and and you can actually create all sorts of fun things using it and it's pretty simple to do you don't have to use any code or anything and I would say the, the like the other end the non-entry level end the um, slightly more advanced end would be the the Bella so the Bella is what my go-to for complex embedded instrument design it's, it's over a hundred dollars so it's not it's not like a beginner board but it's like a single board computer based on a beagle board <laughs> um, but it's like a cape for the beagle board right that's got some fancy analog digital converters and you know analog and lots of digital io as well but it's it's super low latency it's got a great ide and the killer thing for me in terms of my own work is aside from the low latency which is very important to me is there's an open source piece of software called pure data which is essentially a visual coding way of making complex sound synthesis and lots of sound artists and composers already use that which is key so when you're taking um, a piece of technology to an audience that don't typically use technology it's really important that your technology uses the tools that that your desired audience are already using so i was able with this with the, with the bella i've been able to work with musicians who are creating things with pure data and then literally just save their files onto my board so it, it like directly plays the app so that's really nice is it is it digitizing that music or are they've written music as code and so it's there's a few different that. ways to do it so you can make music using c or super collider as well the way i typically do it would be pure data so basically you create in the pure data so there's the answer to that your question really dale is it can do whatever you want yeah. it to yeah. it's just what you program it to so for example i have got one that will trigger samples based on like a gesture i'll send you the 
information about that that's on my github that whole thing you can trigger samples based on gesture but the other thing you can do is have a whole complex audio synthesis system that's embedded so that depending on a number of parameters right so for example if i'm using capacitive touch right so you've got like 30 different inputs on a capacitive touch and each of those 30 inputs could either trigger a note trigger a sample or in the case of my circuit sculpture harp it's actually trigger it's actually slightly generative so you're triggering a calculation which then triggers a, a sound essentially mm -hmm. the pure, pure data and interoperability is definitely a, a good functionality for that so yeah no i'm a big fan of that the, the bella they're based out of a university in london and mm. we do all sorts of interesting experimental instrument yeah mm. very worth looking them up if you are getting into embedded instrument design that's for sure mm -hmm. And give us a sense of, I think the project in the magazine is connecting the Bella up to uh, a duck. Oh, I love and, that project, um, so cute. It, it's <laughs> playful, uh, yes. certainly. There's a lot of people, probably I'm one of them, that don't have a lot of musical theory background, but we love music. And, and I think, how can you get more people into just experimenting? Again, you're not necessarily trying to make sounds that sound good. You're just trying to understand how to control sound. And yeah. uh, that's at least a first stage of experimentation isn't it yeah absolutely there's a couple of different ways that people approach making music and making experimental instruments in london i used to teach a master's module on music tech and i would teach that master's module to musicians so people who'd never done anything with technology Techno. and i would be the deliverable that the students had to like instead of writing an essay they had to write an essay as well but like their major thing that they would have to do is make me an instrument that's what i would mark so i'd mark their instrument and i'd mark their their essay and I would also, I've also taught music to technologists and I would say that the outputs for those two groups, which is like teaching technology to yeah. musicians versus yeah. teaching music to technologists. To yeah. And actually the musicians every time did a better job because yeah. they're not thinking, oh, what sensor can I use? They're like, what sound can I create? Yeah. And what and how and and like how does somebody interact with this? I think that's like a principle that, mm. in some ways, technology is always in search of someone creative to use it, right? So and true. Unfortunately, not every creative person is in search of technology to figure oh. out what to do with it. But if oh, you can balance that out a bit, it it could be very powerful. Almost like technology almost has its own rules for its development and its. It, it doesn't necessarily make anything out of it. It can be faster. Okay, what happens if it's faster, <laughs> right? right? right. You know? Or that you talk about lower latency or something like that it might have a certain benefit. But someone has to understand in an application that it has some benefit. But yeah. from an engineering perspective, it's just faster. Right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So no, what are some of the weird. instruments that you had that come out of those classes? If you give us an idea, we're not talking about oboes and, <laughs> no, and no, organs all. anymore. All right. I had, oh, this is a really cute one, actually. So I had one student who actually, so as part, as part of this course, I would give them an introduction to lots of different microcontrollers and lots of different boards. And this one student who was a, a dad, and um, he was so inspired by the Makey that he got his son to help him design an instrument using the Makey Makey and Lego. And this guy was a DJ, not a technologist at all. And so what he did was make this cool FX pedal out of uh, Makey, a bunch of Lego. And then like whenever you smash the button, it, you, it would trigger one of a few different samples that could be incorporated into the DJ set. But also the samples were made by his recordings of his son that he then like chopped up to make mm. percussive. So he was using fine sound, some of the sounds that his son was making and then used and then was triggering them, physically triggering them with like buttons as part of his DJ set using Mickey and this cool Lego outer as well. So that was a really fun one. We've had people making like interactive, do you know the work of Dr. Kate Stone? Oh, you should look her up. She's really interesting. She does a lot of work around conductive ink printing and she did a TED talk on some DJs, like a DJ, uh, like a paper DJ thing that she, she made, like worth having a look at. Anyway, he was really inspired by her. So he made this like interactive kind of screen printed flyer for a concert that you could touch and you could get a sample of the, you can actually, if you touch it you can you can hear some of the music that's being played so it's like like experimental marketing mm -hmm. materials for for his band as right. well so that's fun yeah. it's interesting um, in a digital age the physicality yes. of 
an instrument is still important, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, actually, the, the, the students all had a choice of whether to create a digital plugin for me or whether to create a physical instrument. And interestingly, quite a lot, like most of them chose to do the physical instrument. I think partially it's because it's novel and people like to hold something in their hands. It's just it's human. fun <laughs> to, ex it is human, it is human. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it, it's exciting and fun and, and new. I think we are in a golden age of being able to experiment with technology. And I think it's just getting more accessible. I really want to see maker techniques and like new tools and new materials being used to encourage a world where more people can invent their own instrument. You shouldn't need to be like an amazing coder in order to do something creative. And increasingly, you don't have to be. Right, right. I've seen, as I said, like some of the most exciting instruments I've seen have been by people I taught to code the day before. You yeah. do not need that much information and you do not need permission to start inventing instruments. You just have to yeah. want to do you, you it. You can't be intimidated <laughs> by it. You just have to try. Well, you know, you're allowed to, you're allowed to feel scared by something yeah. but like the reality is there's also you know, like you are if you want to go out and, and, and invent instruments you are backed up by a long line of in, instrument and inv inventing weirdos stretching yeah. back through time who've made their own things that make sounds and and make noises and it's one of the most joyful human things that we can do you have a new book coming out soon right I do, yes. tell us about it so it's the second book in my own name which is very exciting. And it's as yet untitled, but it's going to be about DIY musical instruments. It's currently being serialized in Hackspace in the UK and, and they'll be publishing as well, which is a Raspberry Pi. Okay. And I'm doing all sorts of things in that. I've done um, a golden disco ball theremin. I have done a giant squishy cuddleable tentacle that you stroke and it purrs. I've done DIY vocal mics using a piezo and an embroidery hoop. I've done how to do gesture control with children's microcontrollers and get them to control Ableton. There's even a recipe in it for the aforementioned jelly bongos because okay, you need the right bongos, okay. yeah yeah because you need that right consistency of the jelly in order to get it to like slap correctly. Really? It's just something very. <laughs> this nobody can see a jelly being slapped and not laugh. It's just hilarious. I'm sorry. But you've got to have the right consistency. I, we need to figure out some maker concerts <laughs> Actually, that are participatory too, perhaps, right? <laughs> that, that would change the dynamic of the concert hall to you get to make some of the music not just listen to it. Absolutely. Actually, there's, um, there's a call for participations open right now at the moment. Of course, Sherry Huss, she's mm -hmm. doing a new Maker Music Festival. So it's happening this year in May. So that's open for proposals at the moment. And I'll be doing something. So if any of, uh, any of you um, listeners out there are interested in um, hanging out and making some music, there will be something happening. Oh, I did want to ask you, we covered the ground with Daphne a bit. Women in history, particular invention history, music history. Is there any, anyone else in addition to Daphne that we should know about? So the person who came after Daphne, um, Delia Derbyshire, was really worth, and there's a really interesting, I think it's only a half an hour documentary that's freely available on her. There's actually a day called Delia Derbyshire Day. I think it's in October uh, every year. And Delia was also at the BBC Radiophonic Workshop after Daphne Oram. And she's very famous. She was the, she did the Doctor Who theme tune. Oh, but the okay. original one. So this was like back in the day when you know, there was not even like four track recording so she was saying like we had to like four of us had to press go at the same time to to get like multiple tracks um, actually recorded so uh, she's really worth looking into and there's a fantastic she's very stylish as well and, and there's a great little documentary on her and a day of like music themed activities every year both Delia and and Daphne were instrument creators and I think Daphne is Daphne's iconic one uh, she's she uh, she did a an instrument called the wobbly Later. Isn't that a fun name? Yes. Wobulator. And I think it does wob 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 noises. So uh, <laughs> it's even like better. Wah -wah. In terms of like contemporary, I'd say one of my big influences is Phoenix Perry, who mm. I believe. Yes, I do. And she's a really good friend of mine. She was actually the person who taught me to use an oscilloscope in her kitchen. And she's a good friend of mine. And she's made all sorts of really interesting musical projects. And yeah, she was a. I don't think one's influences should be 
contained to people who have necessarily gone before you. Actually, a lot of the people I find very influential in my own life in a very real practical way are, are my are the peers that are out there. Sophie Kravitz is really inspiring to me from Hackaday. Phoenix Perry, Adele Lynn is really inspiring to me as well. And in terms of, I'd say Sophie Wong is one of my biggest influences in terms of her aesthetic as well. And in terms of the way that she approached British projects. And I find, I find her look like super fresh and her wearables are really accessible, but also great. Yeah. In terms of, yeah, women who influence me, there's, there's lots from the past, but there's lots from the present too. That's great. That's a good place. Uh, mm-hmm. you conclude here but thank you for your time Helen nice to meet you and nice to chat with you from Portland Oregon yes um, nice to I'm talk gonna... to you as well thank you for yeah. having me Makecast is brought to you by the members of Make Community who support makers in their community and around the world to learn more about membership visit make.co